If there's one band that has persevered ups and downs over the years, Alice in Chains is a prime example. The band was launched into the mainstream music realm with their debut album, Facelift. This was largely due to the help of their music video releases on MTV and their association with Seattle's grunge hype. From there, they went on to release a streak of acclaimed albums throughout the early to mid-90s. Unfortunately, many of the members struggled with drug use. Drummer Sean Kinney and bassist Mike Starr struggled with alcohol addiction, while the vocalist Lane Staley was addicted to hard drugs. In 94, after the release of their number one charting EP, Jar of Flies, the band decided not to tour due to Staley's condition, a prolonged touring break that would last a little over two years. Staley performed his last show with Alice in Chains on April 10th, 1996, for MTV's Unplugged series. Years of inactivity followed once again, and Staley's death in 2002 obviously made everything worse for the band. But this wasn't the first time guitarist and co-vocalist Jerry Cantrell had lost a close friend. The song Wood from their 1992 album Dirge was written as a tribute to his friend Andrew Patrick Wood. The malfunction and mother Ludbone vocalist died in 1990 from a drug overdose, just like Staley 12 years later. And so when you look at Staley and Cantrell performing the song on MTV Unplugged in retrospect, it gives you this eerie feeling. It's like a song about the death of a loved one sung by the person who walked down the exact same path. In this video, I thought I would do a closer examination of the song, and hopefully this can provide some fresh new insights for older fans, as well as maybe providing a good introduction to people that are new to the band. This is the history, sound and riffs behind Wood by Alice in Chains. Wood is a song off of their second album, Dirt, from 92, and was one of five singles that were released with the album. The song was notably featured in the soundtrack for the film Singles, a romantic comedy by Cameron Crowe. The band also appeared briefly in the film as a quote-unquote bar band. It's kind of a sappy love story type thing. It's a good thing to take your girlfriend to. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. earlier, this song was written by co-vocalist and guitarist Jerry Cantrell about his friend Andrew Patrick Wood, and in an interview he had this to say about the song and his friend. I was thinking a lot about Andrew Wood at the time. Andy was a hilarious guy, full of life, and it was really sad to lose him. But I always hate people who judge the decisions others make, so it was also directed towards people who pass judgments. The easiest way to react to someone who's addicted to drugs is to just brush it off as laziness or that there's something inherently wrong with the person, pointing out that maybe they deserve to be drug addicts in the first place. Another point of view would be to say that people end up as drug addicts because of external circumstances and bad luck. They were dealt a bad hand in life and perhaps couldn't cope with their hardships and complicated problems. It's very clear that Cantrell carries this last perspective with him when reading the lyrics of the chorus, which is written from the addict's point of view. Into the flood again. Same old trip it was back then. So I made a big mistake. Try to see it once my way. I'm going to be completely honest here and say that I'm not a big Alice in Chains fan. I'm actually pretty new to the band still. And one of the earliest memories that I have of listening to this band was way back in the early 2000s when I saw their music video and heard their music on VH1. So for you guys who don't know what VH1 is, it used to be a TV channel back in the day, very similar to MTV. And I remember during the breaks in between the songs that would play on this TV channel, they had these montages, montage, is that how we say it? They had, had these breaks where they would play like snippets of multiple songs. And I remember that Wood was one of the songs there. And I remember the, the chorus just really, really stuck out. So I've always kind of had Alice in Chains in the back of my mind to, to a certain degree at least. 
All right, so in the beginning of this song, the first instrument that comes in is the bass. It kind of thumps away and it's a really thick bass tone. I really love it. And after that, all the other instruments come in. The guitars, the vocals, also the drums. And this is where the fun part begins. Now, in terms of the guitar, the very first thing that you'll hear during the intro are these harmonic notes. Followed by two other notes like that. And it's kind of random how that just comes in out of the blue. There are two guitars that are being played here and both of them are tuned to D-sharp tuning. Now, the one that's playing the chords, I guess the rhythm guitar is what you'll call it, is very clean in terms of the sound. It has a little bit of distortion on it, but it's very clean in terms of that tone. Now, a little bit later into the song, during an instrumental part of the first verse, you can hear this solo guitar coming in, and the sound of this guitar is way more clear, it has more sustain, it's more distorted, but it's still very clear in the mix, and it sounds something like this. Something that I find equally interesting to the guitars are the influences that this song is based upon. Right off the bat, without knowing anything about the artist's musical interests, I would say that the song kind of reminds me of something from the early days of metal. Think Paranoid by Black Sabbath, just at a slower pace. The contrast in volume and richness between verse and chorus hints to early alternative rock, like the Pixies, who had a definite link to another grunge band, Nirvana. I think their song Gouge Away makes a really good comparison to Wood, if you're interested in listening to them. Other bands like Green River, Caius, and Sonic Youth also come to mind. But as expected, when you do just a little bit of research, you find out that Jerry Cantrell's influences in particular come from all over the place. He was really into country music in his early years because of his parents. He, he listened to a lot of Willie Nelson. He also later on became really interested in people like Elton John, uh, Tony Iommi, and Ace Frehley from Kiss. All of the stuff, like, you know, uh, AM radio at the time. I mean, I'm listening to, you know, Jim Croce and Gordon Lightfoot and the Beatles and, you know, all of that stuff. And Both my parents were uh, really big country music fans, my mom and my dad. I was kind of more like a classic rock and metal kind of background. And, you know, Sean was into the Beatles and Duran Duran and, you know, uh, you know, Missing Persons, plus all the other rock as well. And, and then Mike was probably more, Star was probably more in line with me, you know, like kind of classic rock and metal and stuff like that. So it's kind of impossible to trace his music back to a handful of artists, but nonetheless, I think it's interesting to, to look into it at least. Now, when the band put this song together in the studio, they really weren't in a good place. Staley started using again the moment he got out of rehab, which apparently was around the time when they started recording Dirge. And Sean Kinney and Mike Starr were apparently drinking heavily during this time too. And from their interviews, it seems like their partying and drug use just kept on going, even when they switched out members. What do you expect from this tour? Expect? A lot of hangovers. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, right now I'm just with these guys. Drinking way too much here in Finland. <laughs> <laughs> I'm not in any way qualified to talk about this because I, I simply weren't there at the time. But from what I've read and researched, it seems like Jerry Cantrell, the engineers and the producers of this album and the song were the ones that kind of pushed the project forwards because the other members were kind of struggling at the time and they wouldn't really, you know, always be on the spot to do their job. Not to say that they didn't put in the, the work to produce this album and make it, they absolutely did. 
But I did read this interview about how Lane Staley had this argument with one of the producers or sound engineers about his working hours. So there were some arguing back and forth. Now, what is really interesting is that in an interview in Finland that they did back in 1993, Staley was asked what he had learned during the past year. So one of the things that he learned was that he needed to become a better communicator. And that's probably related to what happened in the studio during the dirt recording sessions. Have you changed a lot as human beings while doing this or? Maybe just in, in getting more bold or, or, you know, people want a lot of your time and, and sometimes you have to draw the line and say no. Um, a year ago I probably couldn't have said no, but now I can. What has been the biggest surprise for you in the music business or have there, has there been any surprises? The biggest surprise is that it's hard work. I was told there was no, <laughs> supposed to be no work. <laughs> If we look at the guitars during the chorus, we can see that it goes from this A sharp power chord to this F sharp. And it kind of goes back and forth between these. And when that A sharp resolves into that F sharp, it just sounds like fireworks, you know? It's so simple yet so powerful. The song has a guitar solo as well, and to be honest, it's not really the most memorable solo that I've ever heard, but it adds a little bit of that classic metal and rock feel to it, and if you're a guitarist, who doesn't like to play a guitar solo, right? Something I more than love about this song though is the acoustic version from MTV's Unplugged. Can someone please tell me why grunge music and acoustic instruments are such a great match? Grunge bands had the best acoustic performances, period. Nirvana, Pearl Jam and Alice in Chains all delivered some of their best performances in this acoustic setting. And then MTV decided not to be MTV anymore. I actually think the unplugged version of the song is heavier than the original version. Now you would think that, you know, the amplifiers, the heavy guitars, the distortion, you would think that that would do the trick. And don't get me wrong, it absolutely does. It adds up to an amazing sound. But it, there's just something about this acoustic, the acoustic guitars, the acoustic bass, it's at the same raw, bare bones level as Lane Staley's vocals, and it just fits together very perfectly. It just sounds tighter, you know, and that acoustic bass, it's music like this that makes you wanna say, when is the new grunge movement coming around? We need that now. And who knows, maybe it's already here. What do you think? Are we gonna experience a revival of grunge? Let me know in the comments. In the end, I want to say that Wood is a song that is really rich and versatile. It has some lyrics that meditates on the hardships of the people in and outside of the band and the judgment that came with it. It's got some really outstanding riffs that borrow from metal, alternative rock and experimental music. It's also a song that the band can transform into their liking. It can be loud and powerful or it can be intimate and calm. In both cases, it carries with it this timeless aspect. In other words, it's just a really great grunge song. And if you've never really listened to this band before, the song, Wood, is a really great place to start, in my opinion. Thank you for watching.